No, no, no. <laughs> My mother's family was very, were very staid Victorians. And my father's family were wild, raucous Romanians. There were nine children. When my mother moved here, she literally taught a lot of them how to take care of themselves because the parents really never knew about brushing your teeth and doing things like this. So anyway, they were married, I guess, a year later, and I came along. I never had any brothers or sisters. My mother couldn't have any more children. So uh, we were part of the Jewish community and uh, we were a very small Jewish community. It was incredible living amongst this enormous group that was foreign. Although I will tell you something interesting. There was a man named Sam Simon Bamberger who ran for governor in Utah, Jewish man, and he ran under the statement, you know, Jewish people call others Gentiles. In Utah, everyone who isn't a Mormon is a Gentile. So Simon Bamberger ran for governor on a Jew being a Gentile for governor. And so uh, I, in looking back at my growing up, and I honestly believe that history is imbued in my soul because of where I grew up, I am so totally grateful to these people. And they had given me the insight into what I needed to be able to do what I did here. And I'm not through yet, and uh, Go on with your question. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, I wanted to ask you about your, your mom. Would you tell me about your mom? What was her name and um, how her, would you describe her? Her name was Irene Feldman. That was her maiden name. And uh, like I say, she was quite Victorian. She was very, very friendly. But she grew up in an era where uh, women were not allowed to say too many things. And my, fa my father, excuse me, was the oldest, his name was Morris, Morris Aronovich, A-R-O-N-O-V-I-C-H. He had to quit school in the fourth grade to go to work. And uh, in many respects, my father never grew out of a fourth grade emotional mentality. And it, it was difficult. Frankly, I'm amazed I was ever born because of, of the way these things come about. Uh, so nevertheless, I, I had a very interesting upbringing in Salt Lake. Did you have a relationship with your grandparents? With my, uh, yeah, with both my families, uh, but I lived in Salt Lake with my father's family. And yes, yes. And uh, they were fun to be around. And of course, there were eight brothers and sisters that my father had, and there were cousins and things like that. Eventually, everyone moved out including my grandparents, and my father remained running the furniture store. And uh, it was lonely for me. It was lonely for me. But uh, I, uh, I've always been introspective, and I think I've learned a lot from a lot of this. So, uh, What's the next question? The next question is, um, I ask everyone this. Do you remember having a, a toy or a doll that you grew up with that meant something to you? That's interesting. The only thing, and it's very strange, I have never been well coordinated. Never been well coordinated. And at one time I thought I wanted to be a waitress. 
and I would put water in a cup in a saucer and I'd walk it maybe to the desk there and by the time it got there all the water was in the saucer. So I knew at an early age that wasn't the way it was going to be. Oh, I had my share of everything. My parents, in many respects, spoiled me. I had many things. But uh, one of the things that does fascinate me, all my life as a youngster, I wanted to play office. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. And so uh, I thought that was, I always thought about that, especially in my adult years. So I think you can learn a lot about yourself from looking back. As a matter of fact, I live in Glendale. And I remember I was homesick one day, and my mother listened to the radio all the time, and she would listen to Art Linkletter's house party on the radio. And there was somebody from Glendale, California. And I, I couldn't have been more than four or five. And I said to myself, someday I'm going to live in Glendale, California. And that's where I live. Wow. So impressions run deep. I'm trying to write uh, the one question I wanted to ask you before I move, because I kind of sequence my questions chronologically in some ways, but then thematically. And that is, do you remember your parents or your grandparents telling you a nursery rhyme or a story or singing to you that you remember? Well, my grandfather, they came from near Transylvania, Romania. He used to scare me with so many stories. Like you would hang, somebody would come along and hang chickens on the, clo on the clotheslines with, with uh, clothespins or whatever they used then and all kinds of spooky stories. And, uh... You were also growing up during the World War II. Right. So did your family discuss what was happening? Or did they keep that to an adult level? Uh, my mother's brother and one of my father's brothers were in the war and uh, my father's brother would come and visit with us. And, oh, I knew, I would listen to the radio. I think I learned more from the radio than I think I, I, I learned from my parents. I don't think, and I mean this in no, in no awful way. I just don't think my parents had had the education that they had needed in order to truly understand what was going on. My father, you talk about something, my father took me to the wrestling matches all the time. And so that was kind of fun. I saw Gorgeous George, and I saw, and I mean, I was anywhere from five to ten years old, and I'd go with him all the time. And he, he gets so, you could tell, he, he had so much I think anger within him and he'd go and he you know like this and even as a child I noticed this my parents were they were good parents to me they just weren't meant to be together and I should talk I was married to two men that I shouldn't have been together to so they did the best they could we all did mm -hmm. that's all that's right I want I'm, to me. I'm listening to you, and what I've learned from you already. I'm just. I don't know how it would be to grow up being so hated, just and not knowing your own identity in relationship to that hate. As a Jewish person growing up in the middle of mass genocide against Jews in a highly Christian evangelical world, how could how did you survive that? Well, let me tell you something very interesting. I was very naive, and it wasn't until, if you can imagine, high school, I was in class with a friend of mine, a Jewish friend of mine that I'd grown up with since we were tots, and the, the teacher in gym was not kind to me, and Jerry, my friend Jerry, came up to me, and she says to me, 
Are you aware how anti-Semitic this woman is and how she hates Jews? I was in total shock because, you see, those things were never discussed in my family. I'm not sure that they were cognizant of the fact. The one thing I remember, and I don't mean to interrupt you, forgive me, was my mother ended up working with my father in the furniture store. And on Saturdays I would come down to the store, and I remember one Saturday, and I was a young child, very young, uh, and we went up to the Hotel Temple Square, and we would have lunch every Saturday. And we sat at the counter, and we're eating, and all of a sudden a black woman comes in. And you know, uh, who knew these things? I didn't know anything about it. And she sits down at the counter, and our waitress was named Eva. Remember her face to this day. And Eva had to go over and tell her, we're sorry, we can't serve you. I didn't know what it all meant. And whether my mother was able to explain it to me, I can't tell you. When it all started coming together, that kind of sense of the values that were out there that you didn't share, when did that happen? Were you in high school? Was it all together with the 70s or you know early 60s? Was there a moment where you had, oh my God, I don't fit in and I need to leave this place? Or find a place where I do fit Well, in? for some reason, I always thought I was a nerd. I always thought I was a nerd. I probably wore some of the finest clothes you could ever imagine. This is my father. I don't know, you're too young, both of you. There used to be a sweater called Jansen. My father went out and bought me this one style, 12 of them in different colors. I went at eight years old to Girl Scout camp. My father was in the furniture business. I came home. I had a bedroom set you would die for with a beet colored satin headboard and bedspread and new furniture. Princess. And I, I, I didn't want my friends to come in. I didn't want my friends to come in because I was embarrassed. I mean, don't kid yourself, I, I loved it. Let's face facts. But, you know, so anyway, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was a princess. But in school, you know, I just went back three years ago for my 55th class reunion in high school, and I took my oldest grandson. You know, and I've always just enjoyed class reunions. It's fun to see who looks like what today, you know, as opposed to what they did look like and so on and so forth. These people would fall all over me. We miss you. We haven't seen you. And I'm turning around to see who they're talking to. And I said to one of my old best friends, I said, I thought I was such a nerd. Nobody liked me. And she said, Hinda, they loved you. See, I never knew I was liked. I also, you see, I raised my mother. My mother was scared to death. And I, I was a powerful kid, and I'd throw tantrums and she'd run away from me. And then somehow my father would know and he'd scream and yell at me. So I have spent 40 years in and out of therapy. I love every minute of it because it became my surrogate parent. And uh, I do not dislike my parents. I love my parents. They were a product of their environment. 
and uh, I am grateful for the opportunities that I have had to be able to understand myself better. By the time I was 21, I was married twice and had two children from different husbands. I never loved either one of them. The first one I married for my father to give him a son. I went to him two weeks before this enormous wedding. And I knew my, my fiance was already dating his ex-girlfriend. And I go and I tell my father, I don't want to get married. He said, you're getting married. So I got married. 15 minutes after we're married, I get my period. Two and a half weeks later, I'm pregnant. He doesn't want the child. We've moved out uh, of town and tries to get me to have an abortion. His mother comes to take me to have an abortion. That night, her husband committed suicide over the whole thing. I mean, this is a soapbox opera. And I moved back a month later to, to Salt Lake. And uh, I stayed with my folks. I mean, I got my second divorce 37 years ago. This was the first time in my life I ever lived alone. I don't want to get married again. I like who I am. And I like my life. Oh, I might have. Well, I won't say that. I've, I've had my share of men. No marriage. No marriage. But anyway, uh, so I married the second man to give my son a father. We were great parents. We couldn't stand each other. And after 17 years, I finally said goodbye. And as I said goodbye, he said to, he didn't talk to me for three weeks or two weeks, I can't remember. He said to me, could you hold off going to get your divorce until you go with me to the Small Business Bureau? And I said, sure. That was three weeks later. That day he had his first heart attack in January. And so I stayed with him until October. He tried to kill me. And uh, I walked out. And whoever the kids chose to stay with got the house. Well, they knew I was very strong and he had just had a heart attack. He, did any of you, either of you see Guys and Dolls? I have not seen it. You must see it. It's a Damon Runyon. And my husband came from New York. He, he, his last name was Rudnitsky, and thank God he changed it to Rudd. So anyway, uh, he, he was a gambler. He just something, he, if you ever see guys and dolls, please remember that one of these guys was just like my husband. A gambler. A gambler. And I found out, just before I got a divorce, that he had told my mother, he had seen me, I used to be a model. From 13 to 17, I was a model. I looked 25, and of course, with my father, I had the clothes to go with it. Well, he saw me in synagogue one day, my second husband, and I'm dressed to the hilt. And he tells my mother, this is just at the time of our divorce. I saw her in shul, that's what they call the synagogue. And I said to myself, I'm going to marry her. So it was somebody's trophy. So I really had to learn to love myself and to spend a lot of years in therapy. And baby, I love nobody more than I love me. But the important thing is to remember you can't love anyone else until you love yourself first and understand who the hell you are. Very wise words, most definitely. <sighs> Tell me about your children. Very interesting people. My son 
is now with the National Security Agency. He is a, 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 a he is a Middle East analyst. He, when he was born, he was crawling at two weeks. He walked at eight months. He spoke at thirteen months. The biggest mistake I made with him. I mean, mind you, I'm 19 at this time. I'd never had brothers and sisters. I'd never, my father wouldn't let me babysit. So I had never had any relationship with small children. So at the University of Utah, they open up their first uh, preschool. And Jeff is two and a half. So, you know, I think I'm a, a good mother, and I send him. Well, Jeff ended up being the youngest person all the way through. And let me tell you, if you haven't had children yet, remember this. Make sure he's the oldest in the classroom, not the youngest. Because to this day, Jeff is 54. there are still things within him that are still a kid. And he married a woman older than him. And she loves him because she can be his mother. And I kiss the ground she walks on. So never, never let your child be the youngest in the class because fundamentally they are not ready to absorb the social aspects. I mean, he absorbed everything up here. My daughter, they have no children. She, on the other hand, she got, he got his PhD in, in London at the London School of Economics. His wife, who's from San Diego, they met in the, uh, oh, what do you call it? It's, it's like the archives in England. It was in uh, Kew Gardens. They, they met. She was getting her uh, PhD at, uh, uh, what's the other one from Oxford? Cambridge. Cambridge, she got hers there. She became the first historian and archivist for the Homeland Security Department. These are not dumb people. 